Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Global Comic Safari. Today, we're taking a deeper dive in part two of Marvel Star Wars number one global set. Kind of cover some new issues. If you missed episode one, uh, check it out. We'll go, go a little deeper and check into some new books. <laughs> What's up, Matt? Welcome back. What's from up? A, a little bit of a hiatus we took here. A little bit, yeah. We just, you know, life is complicated. I think that uh, with a global pandemic raging and all kinds of other crazy shit happening, uh, we've been, you know, doing our best. But um, yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. Yes. Well, we're ready to go and and go diving back into the Star Wars number one set. Um, hitting another couple, as we said before, is a monster set, lots of issues. So we're breaking it up into several different parts. Um, but I'm excited to kind of get into it. Uh, let's, uh, I'm, I'm with you. I'm excited. I'm a little bit nervous too. So I'm hoping that my whiskey here will <laughs> soothe, soothe, soothe some nerves. of these, some of these nerves. All right. Um, before we get into it, I just want to thank as usual, our friends at EBSI, comicbookinvest.com, your best place for information on Star Wars comics and all your comic book investing and speculating needs. Also check out our friends at Comic Barricade, uh, the best solution for um, storing and protecting your comics. They are great dividers that uh, keep your books from sliding. They've got nice little pegs there. So as your book box fills in you can keep them lined up use the code flip side for 10 percent off genius all genius. right yes yes so this is the book we're talking about uh mm -hmm. kind of the book that saved marvel we went way into that in the uh part one of this series but just wanted yeah. to flash back to it uh this was produced by marvel in july of 1977 uh, beautiful shaken cover um classic I book that is moving up hugely right now i regret myself i was actually looking at a 35 cent variant about six months ago i was talking about it and i should have pulled the trigger and i didn't and now the uh, whole thing went skyrocketed again oh god that thing's so far out in space man <laughs> that 35 cent variant yeah I, 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 I don't know if i you know i've kind of come to terms with the fact that i'm probably never gonna own one. i know they were looking like a good buy and i just didn't pull the trigger so what can i say yeah i mean I, I i have a nice solid vf plus 30 cent i'm happy with that i mean i think that the 30 cent has increased in value yeah a it's, a, lately it's, as it's well. up lately as well it's all it's yeah. all through the roof star wars is hot 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 um you know any yeah. pretty much everything disney owns is is going up 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 so star yeah. wars marvel all the things people love first book we're going to talk about today is the, the okay go ahead marvel movie showcase number one we're specifically talking about the canadian price variant um this was produced by marvel comics in november of 1982 reprints books um issues one through three and it's a two-part series so two tell parts. us a little bit more matt yeah the cpvs the cpvs have actually i think gotten on a lot of collectors radars a lot more relatively recently um and the thing about this book john is this is this marvel movie showcase is actually a true foreign variant you know we we talk about these books as editions till we're blue in the face because you know new new collectors into the niche will, will often say well it's a foreign variant you know just other foreign editions and we have to stop them and go no 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 it's not there are foreign variants, but there's not that many of them. This is actually a foreign variant and not an edition. This was printed in America at the same time as the American original. The only difference is the $1.50 price tag instead of the American, which was $1.25. So about an extra quarter, yeah. which in the 80s is not that big of a deal, I don't think, but maybe. Um, so, so how did Canadian price variants like this come about? Well, in the late 70s and early 80s, 
there were two different distribution methods. And I know people talk about this all the time. Newsstand and direct edition copies. One type, one type sold on the newsstand and the other type sold in comic shops. But there's a problem. Due to currency fluctuations, the companies, Marvel, DC, some independents, they started to lose money in Canada. They knew they had to separate the newsstand books in order to not lose money because, as we know, with the uh, uh, in the foreign game, you gotta you've gotta factor in foreign uh, foreign currency conversion into all of your buys and whatnot. So they were they were losing money on these, so they had to separate them out. Otherwise, they'd lose money on every single issue sold on Canadian newsstands. So boom, the Canadian price variant is born. So they had to upcharge these books heading into the frozen wastes of Canada. Okay, I'm playing. <laughs> I'm playing. They're not frozen wastes. But in my mind, I always think about how cold it is up there. I'm over here in the desert, right? Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, <clears throat> so they would just change a black plate in the printing process, and boom, you have the three distinct versions now. You have the direct edition which is sold in comic book shops and sold in comic book shops in Canada, by the way. You have the newsstand, which was here in America, and you have the CPV, okay? Now, word on the street is that the CPV print runs were fractions of either type of the American book. Very, 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 very small in comparison to the newsstand and the direct. And what do we like to say about that? That's scarcity, baby. That is scarcity all day long. And these can be tough to find, um, and especially in higher grades. Currently, with both grade, uh, not both grading companies, but CGC at least, there are only 13 CPVs in comparison of the 161 Americans. Which sounds, like, about, sounds about right, as we usually think to Canada be about 10%. About 10%, yeah. Um, now, we do know that for a while there, some of the grading companies, I think CB, CBCS always noted the difference, but I think CGC at one point in time did not. They've, been doing, the they've been doing that for a while, but it, yeah, it's, it's the new been standard a while. less. Yeah, so so there might be a few in there hidden in the, in the census. I'm not sure, but that's a pretty huge disparity. Um, you know, that being said, there are going to be tougher books to find in this set than this one. Um, you know, a lot of set builders don't include this issue, being that it's a foreign variant of an American book, an American reprint, I guess is what they would say. But I don't want to get into that debate. I think no, we're just, we're just showing the information. You, d you do it the way yeah. you want. I, I do, think it belongs, don't you? I do like that they they kind of, you know, now it's later on, they recolored Vader black and, and some yeah. of that stuff. So it's it's cool to see. I I probably pass this up all the time and don't actually look at it. Yeah, and, and you know, because of the disparity, I, I think I think if even if you were to not want the American Marvel movie showcase and you were building this set, I think it would be cool to have the CPV, just in yeah. my opinion. Absolutely. And you know, as as we did last time, we were showing some interior pages just to compare and contrast what mm -hmm. you're looking at. So we just wanted to show the the opening splash page. This yeah, and the pretty only much a, yeah. Go ahead. To say, I was going to say the only difference is the indicia is, has more information in it. That's it. Boom. That's it. Because this is a direct reprint. So yeah. Now moving on to a little bit more of an exotic book. Oh yeah, baby. La Guerra de las Galaxias. Number one from Colombia. Colombia. Uh oh, and you missed. You made the common mistake we all of us Americans do all the time, John. What did I do? You misspelled Colombia. We always spell it with a U. It's got an O. Oh man, counting me. <laughs> Dang it. No, but I mean, I make that mistake all the time too. We always do that, and my friends, our foreign friends, always say Colombia. Oh, they're gonna. They're gonna get me now. Colombia, Colombia, La Guerra de la Galaxias, number one, published by Grupo Editorial Colombiano, Greco, in January of 1978. So this one was pretty freaking close to the American original. Um, yeah. The interiors are black and white. 
And this book was distributed in Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Chile, which if you can look, you'll see on the little lower left corner there, you'll see the prices of those. Huh. What do you think of this book, John? I dig it because it's got the, uh, you know, they, they took the Star Wars logo theme and the sky writing and just enhanced it. So it honestly feels like you're looking at a, like a screen drag. Yeah, I, that is very cool. You know, I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. It's like almost like they were mimicking the crawl. Yeah. That's that was a that was a damn good choice, I think. Um and okay, so according to some, I have heard that word on the street was that these books could have a real spotty distribution in some of those countries. So if you were a kid not in Colombia, let's say you were in Ecuador or Venezuela or Bolivia or Chile. You might have missed an issue or two because that the distribution was just a little bit spotty. So I have heard that, um, you know, and poor kids. I mean, that, that's that's really, really shitty. Um, another interesting fact about these Colombian Grecos, these Star Wars books contain no ads whatsoever at all. So how the hell were they? I mean, I guess they were just making their money on the sale on the newsstand, but that's always odd when you don't see well, any ads at all. It is odd, but I mean, I guess they're not having to pay to produce anything but the actual printing. You know, it's, it's maybe a, it's a, yeah. a low buy-in item. Yeah, who knows? Um, also, uh, the back cover matches the front. So this is one of those instances where on the front and back, you have the same exact cover. So that was kind of an interesting thing. Um, that's a design choice that Greco has made with other titles also. Um, you'll see that with like the Spidey, the Cinco. So Cinco and Greco are sort of the same company. You'll see that with the Spideys. You'll see that with some others. Um, now, the issue with this book is that for a while, this book was really freaking tough. Like, it was difficult. Um, and then a few years ago, they started coming out of the woodwork, right? We think that there was some kind of warehouse find on these books. It was just like the Colombian Greco. It's a freaking ghost. And then all of a sudden, boom, there was a, a bunch on, on the market. There were some getting slabbed. There, were, there, were, there was, you know, I'd say about two years, they were plentiful as hell. Well, it could have also been, bam. yeah, there's some, or they, you know, the dollar figure got a point where somebody was actually going to hunt them down. Maybe, maybe. Um, I, but it was it was about two years. And then, yeah. boom, they're gone. Buying buying offs for this issue just started disappearing. And so I think that lends itself that maybe there was a, you know, a, a, if not a warehouse find, somebody was sitting on a, a, a bunch of somebody them. Had a, somebody had a, a, well, big collection they just stumbled upon. That's what I think. I mean, we don't quite know, but they've dried up. I have not seen these Colombian Grecos come to market in in a while so i'm gonna i'm gonna, I'm gonna sidetrack us for a second because okay I have, go, ahead, go for it i have a cool edition of this one. Oh, sorry i have uh oh you're me me not you me <laughs> Woo, me i got a bound set of one to four that i got from uh oh nice i think jf sold me this one and I, I nobody seemed to want it and i was like well it's just so cool because i can see the covers you know on un, yeah unadjusted it's got the Get in there. I mean, obviously they're cut. Yeah, but I just That's still I, really cool. Looks like it's homebound. I think just because of how it's off aligned, it's not centered well. I just yeah. found it really cool and felt I needed to give it a home. Yeah, I mean, you see that a lot in in a lot of uh, non American countries. You know, because remember they didn't have bag and board. So what's the easiest and best way to preserve this book? Now, one of the interesting things about this book. Um, let's go to the splash page, John. All right. See how they put the splash page on the interior cover on the left side? That's kind of different. Saving paper, buddy. Yeah. Um, I no mean, add space needed. And the, I like the, I love how prominent the La Guerra de las Galaxias is there. You know, it's black and white on the interior. So, you know, maybe that's why they didn't need to, Freaking make uh, put ads in there is because they went all black and white. I'm not sure, but I think the jury is still out on how plentiful these are. Um, listen, my advice is simply thus: 
If you see a Colombian at a reasonable price, don't wait, buy the fucker. Because it's, you know, you never know really. We talk about this whole hot and cold thing with the foreign world all the time about how a book seems plentiful and then boom, it's gone. And well, the other th thing is, is Star Wars fans are, are very big hoarders per se. So they don't, mm -hmm. they don't let things go as much as an average comic person does. That's true. There's probably less specking in the Star Wars comic yeah, they, world. They're completionists. They just, they've put it away and they've got it and they're moving on to the next thing they want. Yeah. So if you see a Colombian Greco and it's a reasonable price, buy the fucker, basically. Yep. All right. So I'm going to move on. Next book, Germany. Germany. I'm not even going to try this one. Try it, John. I want to hear you try. Craig des Derne. Craig des Derne. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um Whenever I try to speak German, I try to do it with like from the from the with lungs some, with some anger. Yeah, Craig Destern. This is the Craig Destern one. It's published by Williams Verlag in March of 1978. The issue is full color, 60 pages long, and this book is massive. We're talking magazine size, beautiful rendering of the classic artwork on both the front and back covers weird that they did the same thing that the Colombians did. I didn't plan that. It's just when we were making the show, it's just, but it's true. So this is a German book that on that cover, if you were to, on the back cover, it's the same exact uh, graphics. This issue is has exactly half of the movie adaption. So it contains Star Wars issues one, two, and a half of three. The publication was timed to take advantage of Star Wars hype for sure. It was published about one month after Star Wars debut in German theaters. So that makes sense. This book is bold. It's huge. It's pretty. But it should be pretty easy to find on German and eBay. Um, let's, let's take a gander at that pretty. Uh, uh, yeah, look at the splash. They did a great job. Um, yeah, a this little is higher quality printing. Yeah, the, the printing is a little higher quality. Um, it's got the really cool, nice Craig Stern up there on the top. This is a really neat edition. Um, okay, so this issue is going to be probably pretty easy to find on German eBay. But remember, with these Western European editions, you can always sometimes find them on American eBay but you will pay an American eBay premium. For better pricing, you always want to go to the country of origin if you know how or if you can muster it. These can be found on German eBay. You just need to be patient, wait for a good buying op, and a good buying op should present itself. But like with, with everything, Star Wars, it's hot. So even on German eBay, I've seen these books kind of incrementally getting not only – Harder to find, but a little more expensive. But this is going to be one you should be able to find relatively easier as far as the set's concerned. Okay. I'm going to move on to a more modern edition. This is another um, newer version. This yeah. is France 2010, Star Wars Comics Collector Number 1. Yeah. Why did we highlight this one? We highlighted this one... Just because, okay, so we don't normally go into the modern stuff for sets. But the publisher of this book just pulled all the fucking stops, dude. All the stops. Like you said, Star Wars Comic Collector 1, published by Editions Delcourt in February of 2010. So, yeah, this is one of the few modern foreign editions we're including in this set. The interiors are full color. And this issue has Marvel Star Wars 1 and 2. But what makes this issue kind of neat is that it was sold with three pamphlets advertising this series. A large and a small size pamphlet. These pamphlets are covered with imagery from the movie adaption. The issue was shrink-wrapped. And all these goodies came with it. Now, yeah, see, this is one of them. This is one, and I think there were multiple ones, actually. Um, I've actually seen photos of some different ones. So you get inside this shrink-wrapped cover, you get all kinds of stuff. 
It was so it was shrink wrap with goodies. We think that it was possibly it possibly came with a supplemental 16 page comic. I haven't been able to prove that. Everywhere I go, I ask people, is there a supplemental 16 page comic in this French edition? And they say, Oh, I'll look, I don't remember. The the sad thing is, you know. I think in a lot of re realities, people bought this book and all those extras got thrown away. So if Absolutely. you can find one still shrink wrapped, like that one right there, it's a jewel in my opinion. Um, so one interesting thing about this, this uh, the publisher that did here, the publisher actually used a cheaper paper that was more newsprinty for the interiors so that it kind of, had like this uh, this texture that you could feel, right? Which is really, really, really cool. So, so along with the shrink wrapped goodies, <clears throat> interestingly enough, this this publisher also on issue two included an augmented reality scene played out on the cover. Have you ever played with those apps, John? Um. Yeah, sure. So what this what they did was on one, and I wish I had a video of it. So the, the issue one came with all these goodies. Let's let's look at the goodies real quick. These were all just things that were included in there. Um, and uh, but issue two, when you got issue two, you could set issue two down on like a flat surface and take your your phone and with a special augmented reality app. You would you would you would aim it down at the at the comic, and a a, a freaking uh, ATAT would come alive and start moving around. And I mean, it was <laughs> this publisher just did they pulled all the stops, um, and that's why we include it. Um, the, the French publisher went to great heights to make this series great. Stock French eBay, okay, and you will find it. The tough part is going to be finding this package still shrink wrapped. You can find them loose all day long on French eBay for relatively cheap prices, but finding them shrink wrapped, if you find one on French eBay and it's still shrink wrapped, buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it. Because I can tell you right now, I, I could barely even find images of shrink, still shrink wrapped copies on, on the web. And so even though this issue is from 2010, I think it's special. And I think it's special enough to include in the set. Okay. Now we're going to jump to something more vintage and a little more off the grid. Yeah. Czechoslovakia, 1991. Star Wars Special Comics. It's definitely a trade paperback. Czechoslovakia. Star Wars Special Comics trade paperback. It was published by AG Comics in 1991. Interiors are full color, and this issue contains the, the entire Star Wars movie adaption. So it has one through six. The comic is 108 pages. It's bound like a trade paperback. And um, this issue for me has a very kind of neat history that goes along with it. Remember, Czechoslovakia was a Soviet bloc country from 1948 until 1990. Then the communist country, the communist government was deposed in a peaceful revolution they called the Velvet Revolution. In 1993, Czechoslovakia split into two and became the independent states of the Czechs, Czech Republic and Slovakia. This book was published in 1991 during a year when Czechoslovakia was sort of preparing for the split. So it's almost like Czechoslovakia threw off the Soviet shackles, right? And they were hankering for some American pop culture, and they got it. Let's get Star Wars, baby. Let's get it in there, right? Absolutely. So, you know, some Star Wars experts believe this is a bootleg. Despite the copyright information in the Indicia, I don't know. I, Me, personally, I think the jury is still out. I mean, the only way we could kind of figure it out is if we went into, um, you know, Lucas, uh, Marvel and, and, and Lucas's records, and maybe if we could figure out. Some people call it a bootleg. Some people don't. 
As you can see there on the splash page, it was handled very well. They kept the Star Wars in there. Um, and I actually think that some of the reds are a little more vibrant. Um, great book. Uh, not necessarily all that hard to find. But this book can give you problems. If you don't have a check contact or you're not steeped in kind of the foreign edition, foreign hobby world, this is going to be a tough book for you. Uh, but it was printed relatively recently, and there definitely can be found. It's just a hard one to source because it's not as easy to get into that particular yes. block of e countries. Exactly. You know, former Soviet bloc countries can be tough. Um, we we have a few sources that we've kind of heard about. Uh, some people have had some good luck going on to the Czechoslovakian uh, eBay site. I forget the name of it off off the top of my head. I don't remember the name of it. But if you do a little work, you can find it. But, I mean, who who doesn't want – I mean, go, go back to the cover, John. I think that's super cool with the Hebez de Valke. I don't, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but I, 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 if you're building this set, this is a cool one. This is a cool one to have. Absolutely. All right. So now we're moving to the, the most, I, I would say, off the beaten path of the ones Woo! this week. Yeah. Speaking this of bootlegs. Off. Off the beaten path, maybe this is for, this is so far off the beaten path, John. We might as well be in the ocean somewhere on the raft, right? Absolutely. Um, gosh, uh, and this I'm gonna drop a lot of knowledge on this one. <laughs> um, okay, this is the Indonesian Star Wars bootleg Six Melawan Galaxy Two, published by Sangor Korn Karya. On July 13th, 1978. So even though this is a bootleg, this is an old, old book. This isn't a modern bootleg. You know, this is this is a definite vintage book. The interiors are full color and are lovingly redrawn by the famous Indonesian illustrator, one of my favorite Indo illustrators, John Mitaraga. Um, and look at that. Issue two actually features the interiors are redrawn panels of Six Against the Galaxy from Marvel Comics Star Wars 2. So John did not use... He, guts don't match cover here, okay? This is included in the set. Let's let's go back to the cover real quick, John. What do you think of that cover? I know we've talked about it before, but what do you think of that? It, it's wild. You know, you got the, the the red vest and or the red tunic and, you know, just yeah. a little, little more bold. Bold with the coloring, bold with the, the style. The Vader's got a bigger, kind of more menacing hood. Yeah, he does have a more menacing hood. Vader's in the right color, though. He's black. Um, but what I really like about, about this Indonesian book is how John kind of just made it into his own style. And I love the way Luke, Leia, uh, Obi-Wan... And Han's faces look, they just, they look like westernized, but in this kind of like ran through like this Indonesian filter. There's something really, really cool about it. Um, and this is really John Mineraga's signature style. He, he, he's so good at taking Western art, throwing like this patina of Indonesian style on top of it, but it's still kind of, you know, sticks with the theme. Now, now let's, for those, you know, I've, we've talked about John Mitaraga before, but for those that are new to it, let's talk about it. John Mitaraga was born in Java, a central province of Indonesia in 1941. A young John started studying at ASRI, the Indonesian Academy of Arts. He did not finish, though. He dropped out of college after only a few months of study. So John was basically like, I'm out of here, man. I don't need any more instruction. I'm a badass. I respect him for that. That is really cool. Even without an official education, John's drawings were favored by magazines and book publishers. So this guy, he had to have had just an innate talent that you know was, was visible to everyone. In 1965, he started to publish the first comic album, under the supervision of Kosaya and Ardiasoma, the publishers. After a number of trials, 
he chose to make teenage teenage romance albums. And he was considered the most westernized comic artist. His style was deeply influenced by American comics. And the stories were mostly adapted from comics that are published in, um, in Western countries, whose culture definitely attracted him. However, he wanted to picture the lifestyle of young people in Jakarta, especially those who belong to kind of the high income level of society. According to Minaraga, picturing poverty is not relevant for a teenage romance, which has to be romantic and easy. So that's a that's an interesting philosophy, right? So he's making romance comics, but he he doesn't want to do romance that's like the typical uh, average um, Indonesian on the street, right? He's going to like the higher class Indonesians, you know, the movers and the shakers, the the ones with money, and he's he's showing the romance between them. Now, you can argue that maybe it would be cool to have common people romance, but, you know, for whatever, for whatever reason, that was his philosophy. Um, up to that moment, he had published more than 100 titles, which is a lot. But Cebua Nora, Nora Hitam was the one that put him on top, publishing two albums per month, with payment around 60,000 rupee in average, John Midaraga was at the height of his income and profession. It is most likely that he was the only comic artist who recognized Western comics of that era. So for whatever reason, within the Indonesian comic market, he was the one that was looking outside of the country and bringing those styles and those influences in. Um, which is very interesting. Um, so John Mitaraga was definitely against pornography. He was fighting for comics as a mission as an educator, which is another interesting thing. Remember that Indonesia is a very conservative country. In fact, they have a whole um, genre of horror book that is simply there to show you hell and what happens if you, you know, uh, uh, sleep with a woman outside of wedlock or, or whatever? These are there are literally horror books simply to show you hell, to bring you back into the fold of religiosity. Um, John Mitaraga was a legend in the Indo world, and I believe I could be wrong. But I think he might be the very first Indo artist to bring Western style comic book art into the Indo world. He did this with his own Indonesian style, of course. But man, if this guy wasn't a great and forward thinking artist, I don't know what it, what one is. Um, unfortunately, um, during the 1980s, very cheap Japanese manga books sort of took over the Indonesian market and they pushed out a lot of the original Indo material. John gave up comics in 1989 to devote himself to painting, which he continued until his death of lung cancer in 1999. But John Mitaraga is the legend in Indonesia. He's the guy that brought our books into Indonesia and did all of this amazing stuff. Let's let's go in and compare some stuff on. Okay, so so let's go to the splash page of this one. We've talked about this before. Um, but what do you think, John? I mean, well, yeah, he he did a complete redraw, changing you know the the location, the shape, the colors. It's you know inspired by is is the best way to call it. Yeah, not, definitely. Not as much mimicked, inspired by. Inspired by, yeah, definitely. He didn't just go in and redraw the panels the way Chaikin did. He made sure to make some changes, particularly on this one. He put Luke's face in the dirt. He did not have him up. Now, um, recently, relatively recently, I acquired a. So this series only has three issues: issue one, issue two, and issue three. Um, zoom in on me real quick, John. So the one we include in the set is Six Melowan Galaxy, right? It's it's the cover that. Uh, is based on the Chaikin issue one cover, so it belongs in the set. Beautiful book. I recently acquired issue two, 
or issue three, I mean. And I love this series. I have yet to get issue one, but these are badass books. Badass books of Star Wars foreign editions. Let's go to some interiors of that, John. All right. So we're going to look at number three. Yeah, let's look at number three. So we didn't go all crazy, but um, I, I didn't take a whole lot of interior shots, but I just wanted to show some of the differences that John did. Um, what do you think about this splash page? I I feel like they kind of made Vader a little more menacing almost. They did. He's darker. He's bigger. Um, I like that John made the conscious choice to eliminate the chapter three and all that stuff. He just did it as text. I really think that the, that he made a decision here to include the entire uh, 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 trooper. Um, notice on the American, the stormtrooper's head's chopped off. Yeah, his head is gone. John said, "No, I'm going to make a decision to add his head." Now you can argue that his version of the stormtrooper's head is different than than what we would think, but I kind of like that call. Look, notice he also made the. Uh, the leg on the stormtrooper yellow for some reason. I, I don't know why he did that. Huh. Um, he also made the planet. I'm not sure. Do you remember which planet that is? Are they looking at Alderaan? I think they're looking at Alderaan. But, but it's, yeah, it's definitely more well kind of fleshed out. Yeah, he, he, he brought Alderaan, the planet, up to make some room for some of the text down in the bottom. That's kind of neat, I think. Yeah. Let's, let's go to the next one. Ah, uh, okay. This is the destruction of Alderaan. Yeah, and he made some very conscious choices here as well. What do you think? Um, I, you know, I he definitely went for maximum effect. You know, he he kind of the explosion itself is just taking up more of the the, the screen. Um, yeah, and he's kind of making sure he shows a little more emotion into the characters, I think. Yeah, he did He did remove um, the close-up of... I forget that character's face. It's stupid because I'm a Star Wars fan and I'm, I'm missing it. He removed that, and it looks like he kind of just concentrated more on the explosion. He made it kind of more yellow. Um, he also brought the explosion more into the foreground. You know, like on the American one, you kind of see him standing there in the uh, yeah. in the big window. He kind of did. He took. He de-emphasized them and emphasized the explosion more. Um, but it's super cool. He put Leia in a yellow dress, which actually makes her pop a little more. But he kind of pulled back from them, which is interesting. Yeah, you know, he just wanted to show more. I think. I think he. He doesn't appear to love close-up shots. That's what I've gathered in, in some of these comparisons. He likes to pull things back a little more. He does, definitely. And um, on this issue, I'm going to open this up. Zoom on me, John. Yep. At the end, at the end of, of issue three, there's like an there's like an element where they. Uh, well, this is a cool panel too. I don't have the where he shoots this guy. In the American issue, that panel um, is smaller. He made it larger. But on the American issue, he talks about uh, Obi Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader having a, a battle. It's getting ready to battle. He did this really cool um, final panel. And this is not in the American issue. And it's really cool. I like yeah. it. I, I like the way Vader looks there. I like the different coloring of his helmet. Um, these are badass issues, guys. If you can find an Indonesian, any of this series, Six Melamon Galaxy, which was Six Against the Galaxy, Bintog Mwat, I don't know what that means in indonesian um if you can find these books i would suggest you buy them you know they're a little rough you know some collectors find the art a little rough you know they they yeah. are a little rough but these are jewels guys 
these are absolute jewels of the of the Star Wars one set, in my opinion. Um, one of the things that I love is seeing how other countries produce this material, and 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 it it kind of gets refracted into this kind of cultural and societal <coughs> prism, you know, and and this and this artwork and these stories come out on the other side. Um, one day, I think it would be cool to translate them and see if there was any weird things in the translation on, on some of these books. But uh, I think, what can you say? I, I love the Indonesian bootlegs. I love yeah. them. I mean, it's, it's, it's cool to see somebody taking our cultural icons and, and giving them a little twist versus, you know, the, the other editions where they, they use the traditional art and just um, change, change the language stuff. They can do some creative things there, but when they do a complete redraw, that is, uh, it's just interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it, in a way, it's kind of mind blowing. It's, like it's so of, much work. Oh yeah, tons of work just to to give you a product that they could have probably just as well copied and put out cheaply. Yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. You're exactly right on that. And, and uh, he put a lot of effort into that. A lot yeah, of he did. And you know, John, we've gone down the, the Indonesian rabbit hole before with some shows. It is deep and wide. Yeah, I, I, I don't dive in there much just because there's enough of you crazies down there. I'll, I'll stay. Yeah. I'll stay, like, stay hey, on the places I know. Yes. We're like, come down here with us. <laughs> yes. Or the, the normal comic community is looking at me like I'm far down the rabbit hole. You guys are, you guys are coming out the other side. So. Yeah, the Indo, I mean, uh, yeah, the, some of the Indo horror stuff is. Poof. It's mind blowing, especially that religious stuff. Yes, they're absolutely. Trying, you know, it's it's crazy. But this this was a fun show. I'm glad we're back, man. Absolutely. So you know, we got some other issues coming up. We got at least two more features on Star Wars. One we're going to yeah. work on. Um, check check out everything on Tales from the Flip Side. Uh, we got the Monday show. The uh, you know the cream of the crop. We've got the comic book women. We've got uh, the the spec ten. All kinds of shows going on. Quality content every night. And oh yeah! Anything else you want to say tonight, Matt? Um, I'm glad to be back. Go check out Tales from the Flip Side. the 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 channel is doing some amazing stuff. Uh, I mean, pretty much any kind of part of the comic hobby that you're into, you'll probably have a show there that you would like. Um, I would also uh, say if 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 you haven't checked out Star Wars Part One. Check out part one. We go into some amazing issues there. And John and I will be back. We plan on doing some uh, – we plan on doing more set shows, but we want to we want to do some interviews and some stuff where we get to to meet some of the, you know, the key players within the foreign niche and the foreign hobby, uh, comic shop owners and collectors and big, huge set builders. We're going to kind of move in that direction a little bit. And so we will be back and uh, – Thanks for watching us. Absolutely. This is great. If you got this far, please like and subscribe, and we'll see you soon.